a cylinder fails compression check coming out of annual. What do you do? We're going to find out in this episode of In the Hangar. Okay, my plane's in annual. I get that dreaded call from my mechanic that one of my cylinders has failed the compression check. Well, we only have 360 hours on these cylinders, so I gave a call to Superior, who manufactured the cylinders, and they sent some guys down to check it out. Okay, so we're here at my plane uh, in the hangar special. I'm here with an amazing group of guys who uh, have come down to look at my cylinder and we'll talk about the problem. But with me is Bill Ross. Bill, uh, you're VP of... Vice President of Product Support. So Product Support, we have John Effinger, whose title is Cessna John. And Some people use that terminology <laughs> but uh, they can find it wasn't me they can find more info from you at cessna rigging.com that's correct scott hayes vice president sales and marketing sales and marketing right and we have Teacher nick Tom. kuklinski captain yes. nick there who is a um, partner in my plane here i would say lola but just about every owner other than me and past owner does not like that name Yes, so, okay. I would have picked a different name, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, so here's what happened. Uh, Lola uh, came in for annual to John. Uh, John, uh, take it away. What, tell us what happened with the compression ratings and, and where we were at on that. Low compression on a hot engine check. Okay, and what were the numbers? And what do we like to see? Well, the numbers are in front of you there. <laughs> Well, I don't know how to do you, read. You I really want to go mechanic. through the numbers? <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, we're going to go through. Well, because through. Here, here's the deal. For those owner-operators, those pilots out there who aren't IAs, um, or AMPs, I mean, um, we don't know kind what of the numbers what they mean. For. Okay. You, you could say, oh, Dan, you had a cylinder at 50. I don't know. Is that good? Is that bad? I mean, I really don't know what's going on. So, so tell me on a compression check, dumb it down for me. Uh, you know, you call me up and you tell me what. Well, we, we didn't pass the uh, master orifice check on one of the cylinders, and we had low compression readings. We got a lower trend, and um, we, got, we got things we need to look at. Uh, the, the engine has low time on the cylinders, 260 hours. We should be looking at somewhere around 74 to 78, varied throughout the cylinders with that many hours on it. And we had what? And so we're going to go 1 to 6. It's 60, 53, 65, 30, 52, and uh, 54. So the 30 is the big, big concern. The 30 is the big concern because with the master orifice, and we're going by the Continental Bulletin, and all the gauges now have a master orifice in it. And I used two different gauges, and one was 39 for the lowest reading and the one that my new gauge is 44 on the master orifice. So we dropped down below both of those at 30, okay. and that was on number four. All right, so then I, um, you know, these cylinders are, are, we had a top overhaul 360 hours ago. Is that right, or 260? Got to go back to the book. I work on more than one plane. <laughs> 363.6. Yeah. So 363 hours ago, we had a top overhaul. We went and bought superior cylinders. And that's before I met you guys. Mm -hmm. That's before right. I yeah. met Bill and, and Scott, <laughs> VPs at Superior. So, I, John, you, you gave me my choices. I picked superior cylinders. We got them from Superior. <coughs> and uh, we put them in. And uh, we, you know, we uh, did the break in. We did all that kind of stuff. And so now we're still really young and alive. So when you called me and told me that we were low, I call. I contacted Scott, and uh, Scott. I mean, is it pretty usual that you guys would would uh, back your products up by coming out here and, and looking and all that kind of stuff? This is the only way we back our products up. We we want to see what issues are going on. It, we we could have had a baffling issue. We could have had a lot of things that we couldn't see over the phone. It's it's funny when we have these conversations, and you know it as well as we do. That when you ask a customer, well, how's the baffling? You know, I have the CHT issue on number whatever. How's the baffling? They always say, it's awesome. Send me a picture. And there's no baffling. Or, yeah. or there's a hole in there you can put a, a tennis ball through. So going out there and seeing it really lets us understand what's happening. Have this dialogue about, you know, how do you run this? What do you guys do? You have a, a two-owner situation here. You might 
be radically one direction, you may be radically one direction, we might True. see some of those instances. So this just affords us a tremendous amount of real world, what's happening the way you operate. Now you guys have come out and looked at it. Uh, Bill, what'd you find? Well, uh, with John, we uh, first thing we did was we borescoped the cylinders to look for any gross anomalies that may be going on uh, within the cylinder. Um, and all of the results of the borescope inspection were the appearance of a normal cylinder. This the, the valve signatures, uh, as far as the heat tracing of the exhaust valve, the intake valve condition, uh, the cylinder bore condition, the amount of combustion deposits were absolutely picture perfect. Um, so we didn't find anything there. We paid particular attention to the uh, cylinder uh, number four that had the uh, 30 compression reading which was below the master office leak limit set forth by Continental. Um, in, that, in that particular cylinder we saw a light hone pattern uh, which is a purposed uh, scratch that we put in a cylinder to retain oil uh, which could indicate uh, uh, some abnormality in the cylinder a little bit as far as wear, something like that. We retested the engine with the compression test in accordance with Continental's bulletin. We did a cold compression test and that, that's one thing we did vary is we did not do it hot. We did it cold. Um, all of the compressions were for a cold engine um, acceptable. Even number four did come up to, I think it was 45, and that could be just because the oil's a little thicker and things like that. The plan is, and again, in a concert with the instructions for continued airworthiness, uh, is when the annual is complete, we will fly the airplane again for an hour at a best power, richer mixture, 75% power, come back and retest number three. Um, number four. Excuse me, number number you just, four. You keep wanting to replace number three. I know, I know. <laughs> it's like a surgeon. Is it the right leg or left leg? I know, I know. But uh, yeah, cylinder number four, and if uh, if it doesn't come up, then uh, as we do with all of our, our products and our customers, we will stand behind it, and uh, you're covered 100% parts and labor under warranty. Wow, that means a lot that you guys stand behind it enough to not only parts but labor too um that you would cover that that as an owner that just that makes That's me great. feel incredible um that you guys would stand behind that is that pr pretty normal in the industry no <laughs> <laughs> normally <laughs> normally you hear it's the pilot error you know it's always the pilot error well, you I, know I, you run the cylinders too hot you know i i hear that every time and right. i don't care who the engine builder is it's always going to go back i think it's know. fair to note too that in part of this whole uh assessment of the health of this engine that's one of the first things we did is we got the download from your jpi and we did go yeah, through that data that, yeah. and the 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 flights that we looked at there were certainly there's no operational anomalies whatsoever you guys are operating uh, the airplane uh in in concert with the uh, recommendations of Cessna and Continental. Um, that was further backed up when I did the boroscope inspection. The amount of combustion deposits present and things told me that the engine is operated uh, as it should be. And it's a conforming engine. Yes. You know, that's that's another big issue. What do you mean you by have. conforming yeah. engine? Like your fuel flows are set right, Correct. your ignition mm -hmm. set right, you don't have intake leaks, you know, your turbo is set up right all the fuel scheduling, injection system, intake leaks, you know, all the, you have to have, you have to start with the conforming engine. We checked know. that too, and, and that's a very good point, John. Not only did we look at how you were leaning the engine, but we also looked at, Scott and I actually looked at several flights at the takeoff to the look GT, at the fuel GIT. flows, the uh, exhaust gas temperature, cylinder head temperatures, TIT, those types of things to ensure that the fuel system was calibrated regularly. That's something that's often overlooked on a fuel injected Continental, and that has to be done at least at each annual. Uh, and very important to cylinder life, and all of that was normal. And it's very important as pilots, we've had this discussion several times, but I'll reiterate for the video, <laughs> is if I don't know something's out of adjustment, I can't fix it. So as a pilot, 
you know you should be hitting 36.5 on every takeoff once the engine oil is warm. Manifold. And you know that you should be hitting 2,700 RPM. Mm -hmm. And you know with your fuel flow, you should be hitting roughly 32 gallon an hour fuel flow. So if you've, you, and, the and we have, yeah. and we, the, the on the takeoff, yeah. right. And, and we know with your engine monitor, we have conservative numbers in there for your warnings and it's already been set up for conservative warning. So at 390, you should be getting an alarm. You know, above 2700 RPM, you should be getting a red alert, yeah. you know. Um, and your TIT, we have in the EGT set at 1550. So if you've got a yellow warning, that's a caution to you as a pilot that you need to take action that there's a parameter that's on the verge of going out of, out of spec. So there's really with this engine management system no reason that you shouldn't be alerted beforehand to do something as a pilot to correct it. And if you can't control it, then it needs to come back to me and we need to find out why. Um, you were talking about sometimes hearing or looking in the cylinders and sometimes seeing uh, things that you don't like, uh, scoring or, uh, you know, heat deals. But that brings me up to the point of, you know, running Rich Peak, Rich of Peak and Lena Peak. Uh, do you find one uh, series of up in an aircraft better than the other? That's a very good question. And uh, actually, uh, it can go both ways. If if a pilot runs out, outside of the recommendations by the manufacturer, let's say that we have an airplane that is recommended to run 50 degrees lean of peak, okay. and the pilot says, well, the heck with what the, the, the engine manufacturer says, I'm gonna run 125 degrees lean of peak. Ooh. It is possible that they could have more combustion deposits because they're robbing the engine of so much heat. They could also be causing problems within the internals of the engine with corrosive attack because the oil temperature is not getting hot enough. Ah. Yes, the fuel flow goes down, but we grossly become inefficient with the airframe engine combination when we do that. So we have to consult the POH um, as to where we should be. When, when we're bore scoping engines, we can also tell if a, if a customer runs rich of peak at peak lean a peak or if they don't doesn't know, lean on the ground they don't or yeah. they don't know what the red knob does yeah we oh, okay. we've seen yeah. we've seen that before yeah, and and strangely enough wow. a lot of burned exhaust valves are the result of not leaning at all or not leaning on the ground and those combustion deposits begin to form on the valve yeah. and the valve cannot close against the seat fully because if those those lead salts and those uh, 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 combustion deposits are there and so each combustion cycle, that valve is then torched, just like a hot piece of metal in an oxyacetylene torch. And that will, over time, mm -hmm. burn a valve. So it's very important, and I know in the, we've talked about this before, and I sound like a broken record, yeah. but yeah. engine manufacturer's recommendations are engineer tested data. It's just not gee whiz information that they decided to put out there. They actually did a lot of testing to come up with those recommendations because it, we know as an engine manufacturer and a parts manufacturer, that's how you get these things to go the distance. And well, then you're within, smart, well. within limits, uh, is heat a bad thing? In, no, in and that's a good point. A lot of people yeah. think that heat, heat is a four letter word in these engines and, and it's not. We have people that chase cylinder head temperatures because they've read an article that there's a demon that lives at 380, uh, 380 degrees Fahrenheit and so they target 350 or 300, and they can do that with the red knob by just pulling, going further lean a peak, it will cool everything off. But we also see a lot of engines with corrosive attack, cam and lifter yeah. distress, and things like that these days as a result of yeah. being too if, kind to the engine. If 390 is the limit, then 350 is better. So right. 325 has got to be better than that. So if we're at 200, exactly. you know, 200 has got to be great, right? But well, well, then no. it brings up the other question um, that we talked about before. Um, so what's, uh, shouldn't I be concerned with shock cooling if I'm uh, coming down from altitude? Not really. The, the shock cooling, uh, and, and there's a lot of articles and a lot of engineering data that has been uh, performed with regards to shock cooling. Um, 
I talk to, I, I, I draw an analogy between idle cutoff and shock cooling. If you're really not going, if you're worried about shock cooling, you would never turn the engine off. Or flight schools. that is shock cooling. <laughs> uh, but the reality is, is the metallurgy today is very, uh, very good. And it's not something that we really need to worry about. Uh, throttle movements to the point where we are closing the throttle for a long period of time where we're for a long period of time aerodynamically driving the propeller, uh, driving the engine can in some certain circumstances set up ring cavitation and that can be bad. And that's more of a danger in, uh, in, po in, in power management than, than shock cooling would be. In fact, engine manufacturers in their test cells, when they're testing new engines on a hot summer day, if the engine starts to over temp, they spray it with a mist of water to keep it cool. If you're an instrument rated pilot, you've certainly flown in heavy rain, and so, and you don't have cylinder cracking and things like that uh, going on. So, uh, shock cooling in the day back years and years and years ago in the old radial engines with metallurgy wasn't what it is today. Well, you got supercharged. That's true. So that, That's true. That, that was a whole other. You had a whole different ball game, but in what you have today, uh, I tell pilots the engine's pretty tough, but you know. Fly the airplane is the mo most important thing uh, and not worry about shock cooling. The one thing that I always bring up to people on that is you got to look at these flight schools. How many people in their training mm -hmm. are doing stalls, power on stalls? And the flight school aircraft go well beyond TBO. Well, if anybody's shock cooling an engine or the jump planes, those guys are shock cooling every, mm -hmm. every flight. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the shock cooling today, you know the supercharged engines that was a whole nother ball game yep. and we're carrying over a lot of these old myths and all these old rules of don't do this and over square well you've got a turbo <coughs> uh, it, you know we're dealing with old tech old myths that have been brought over from training you know and and you know cfis and don't do this and i can't tell you how many times i've gotten a 182 and i'm giving it full power through my climb and I've got a guy coming unglued to the right of me going, you're gonna blow my engine up. You know, you need to reduce power. Well, it's a normally aspirated airplane and the only thing I'm concerned with is my climb rate to get to altitude to set up my engine so that I could run economy cruise. And, you know, you're not gonna hurt a normally aspirated engine by going over square, you know, because normally aspirated engine, you wanna get as much as you can out of that manifold pressure unless you're looking at fuel economy and right. you could do a long prolonged climb or something like that but but what you're doing by reducing that power now you just reduced your fuel flow and you reduced your fuel flow on a climb you're running the thing high rpm now now you're doing damage to your engine and damage to your cylinders because you just started to a lean climb. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, I want to ask you two a question, and I'm going to put my partner Nick on the spot. Okay. Uh, we've had a disagreement that we want you two to settle for us, if you can, and that's um, yeah, something close to what you just talked about. When we're taking off from Hicks, a 3,300 foot runway, short runway, um, you know, I'll throttle on in, you know, I'm, you know maybe five, six, seven seconds. Uh, Nick's like, no, slow it down. Be a, a long push on that throttle. What, what do you guys say? S settle the argument between Nick and I. Well, I'll get my train of thought. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be somewhere in between with you guys. Yeah. The danger in rapid throttle movements in, in these engines is detuning counterweights. Okay. To detune the counterweight, you've got to be really pumping the throttle and doing all kind of weird stuff. Um, the smooth application of power ensures that you probably won't overboost should something fail. And I know you're monitoring that as you go up with right, your manifold right. pressure. Yeah, but the up. engine should be, when the oil temperature, and he caveated that earlier, with oil temperature being warm, you should be able to slam it to the stop and it go to 36 and a half and you'll be okay and not hurt the engine. On a warm engine. First takeoff of the day never happens. First takeoff of the day, I was well. It'll always overboost. You've already run up. You've done all the stuff. It should be. It should be. But but I, you know, we're talking eight seconds or something like that. I'm probably a little more aggressive 
when I fly than that. I mean, before eight okay, seconds, so you're, I'm in. Okay, so you're even, okay, so you're in my ballpark. Six, I don't slam six, it, but I, I just either. come in smooth and smooth application of power. While I'm doing that, I'm looking at the engine monitor, I glance at it, make sure everything's coming up, make sure the oil pressure's there. And in a turbocharged engine, I'm looking that I don't overboost it. Correct. That, yeah. the, that, the, that the safety um, mechanisms in here for not overboosting are working properly. Again, you're on a 3,300 foot Right. Runway. My point is that so, I want to get. Yeah, see, you want to. You want to be go, hitting no your manifold point if pressure I rotated in by your a certain arm. point of that runway that I abort the takeoff, Absolutely and I don't right. want to. I don't want to constantly do short field takeoffs where I'm riding the brakes. No. Because then no. I'm tearing up my brakes. <clears throat> and you're right. tearing up your prop. Right. And those those are good points too. Absolutely. So, you know, if, if you're going to put it on fast, if you're going to apply the power fast, just be cognizant of the possibility of overboost. As long as you are cognizant of that, you're not going to hurt the engine to accelerate it quickly. You're not so going to detune it. Define fast. Engine. So define fast would be from, say, one or two seconds to, say, four seconds. That would be a little fast. But five seconds Four Mississippi. eight <laughs> seconds. Because when I'm bringing it up, it's just from, from a standard. You don't want to be that slow, one, though. One, two, three, thousand four, thousand five, thousand six, thousand seven, thousand okay. eight. Okay. Now, if you do that, if you do that, where are you at when you start to pull the wheels off the ground? Well, a little bit. You're about halfway down the runway. Well, but you said about four or five seconds, so maybe the half yeah. medium is between five and six, maybe not going to eight or nine seconds. Because I do use more runway, but I'm thinking <clears throat> I want to be Ginger to Lola. I, she's a little late. I don't. Well, the engine's roaring down the runner. It feels good. And you it need just to buy off. a normally aspirated airplane. I guess I could. I would, <laughs> I would just say <laughs> that, a, that a constant. I would. I would sum it up that when I when I fly when I take off, no matter what it is, and then there are some airplanes where there is a um, a hesitation at 30 inches, you know, Cessna 402, for example, but. Uh, just a smooth application of power smooth to full power and just I, I wouldn't worry about counting wouldn't worry about how long it takes it you know as, as far as that I would just end with the power and let it go but be careful about over boost especially on yes, the first flight of the day and that's as long as you're monitoring that then you're not going to have any problems and even if you can over boost it if you're normally aspirated oil temperature if you got the right oil temperature then you're safe to go but you know, as far as how short and how long, you hit it right on the money. It's smooth application. Yes, right. You know, uh, I'm not a real proponent of the uh, holding the brakes. Right. You know, if you're not doing a That's short field short takeoff time. over an obstacle, holding the brakes is going to eat your prop up. You're really kind of loading everything up real hard. That's really not that necessary unless you got to get over top of something. But where we're at, you've got to get, check ride, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. you've right. got to yeah, get, you know, you've got to get over, right. you know, hangers, you know, when you're taking off to Just North more. End. Yeah. If you're going to wait, you know, six Mississippi, seven Mississippi, <laughs> eight Mississippi, you'll you're be passing. Down the you're, well, you're over well, halfway well, down, or you're, you're three quarters well, away with this airplane. Three, well, I tell you, uh, I was most recently was at Bill's house. He lives on a 2,400 foot grass strip that's got oh, mondo trees at one end of it. And, so oh, it, it's breaks. all about yeah. it, it's all about that smooth application of power. Uh, it's got a 182 that we were flying off of that strip, but I mean that's plenty of airplane for it. But you always wait till you got 100 degrees of oil temp, no matter what. Okay. You, you really want to make sure that's it, and then uh, you roll it out. Make sure a quick scan, everything's good. It's where it needs to be, and then you're golden. Guys, it's amazing that you came out, Bill. I really appreciate you coming out. Thanks for for being here. No uh, John, as always, uh, it's, it's comforting to know that somebody like you is the first person who's who's watching this airplane. Uh, it, there's a comfort level when when I'm flying. I'm yeah. sure Nick feels the same way Absolutely. that you are the one that's that's watching our aircraft. It, it comforts me greatly. Scott, the customer service from Superior, man, you guys, um, I, I'm blown away. So uh, thank you very much for everything. Uh, Nick, on behalf of Nick and I, uh, we want to thank you guys for, for doing this. All right, so there you have it. And, uh, you know, I'm not being paid by Superior. I paid for the cylinders that are on this plane. So this is not, you know, some kind of endorsement or sponsorship deal. I can tell you honestly and openly, 
I am blown away by the service of Superior. So um, I would definitely, if I have to buy a new cylinder in the future, I know who I'm going to go with. Thanks for watching, you guys, and we'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.